excited to have all of you all present with us this afternoon, and we are more excited to have Dr. Singal with us this afternoon um, as our first Mellon Scholar uh, for the 2018-2019 academic year. The Mellon Scholar Initiative is funded through the Andrew um, Mellon Foundation, and it provides an opportunity for us to bring guest lecturers to campus. Our first lecturer was last year, who was a Hendricks alum, um, Dr. Deshaun Avales served as our inaugural um, lecturer, and so we're happy to have Dr. Singal as our second lecturer in this series. It provides an opportunity for us to think about excellent scholars in their fields um, that fill a gap for us in our educational mission and think about the faculty and what we are able to offer here, and to give our students an opportunity to think about the diversity that exists um, within the fields um, that we have out in our world. And so we're excited to have him present. Um, and excited to have you here. To introduce him is actually one of his former students who actually nominated him as a Mellon Scholar, and so I'll turn it over to Amber Jackson. Oh, and I didn't mention who I am. I'm Dion Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> and I serve as the Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion here, and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Arvind Singal. He is the Samuel Shirley and Edna Holt Marston Endowed Professor of Communication and Director of the Social Justice Initiative at the University of Texas, El Paso. Uh, he's also appointed since 2010 as the William J. Clinton Distinguished Fellow at the Clinton School of Public Service in Little Rock. And since 2015, the Distinguished Professor to Faculty of Business Administration at the Inland University of Applied Sciences in Norway. Singal is internationally known for his work on the diffusion of innovations, the positive deviance approach, organizing for social change, the entertainment education strategy, and liberating interactional structures. He is co-author or editor of 13 books and has published some 200 peer-reviewed papers. His research has been supported by the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Ford Foundation, and the list goes on. Uh, in addition, he served in advisory roles for the World Bank, UNICEF, the US Department of State, USAID, Save the Children, as well as other organizations. Singal has traveled and lectured in over 90 countries of six continents, and we are thrilled to have him here at Hendrix. Please help me extend a warm welcome to you. Thank you, Amber. Is my voice amplifying? It seems it is. Yes, it yes. is. It's working. And thank you, Dr. Jackson. Thank you. All right, welcome to this session. And it seems it's a formal setting with the auditorium style. I think this is the first time Amber has seen me in a jacket. <laughs> and a it's the first time that. Marsha, you and Amber are probably seeing me use a PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Did we ever use a PowerPoint? And I can't ever remember using a PowerPoint in a class. And, uh, and usually my classes are circles, which are moving. And I don't know how I can make these chairs move. But uh, we'll see. We'll go with the flow. OK, so <clears throat> thank you. I'm very honored to be the Mellon Scholar. My mother is even more happy than me, and <laughs> she's telling everybody I'm here on stage. Okay, let's see if this works. So how many of us have heard the term positive deviance? All right, good. I can get away with practically anything. <laughs> <laughs> the few hands uh, that are uh, here, I actually heard of this concept in 2004 for the first time. So that was almost about 15 years ago. And I just say that it flipped my world upside down. And, uh, and I've continued uh, in the last uh, 15 years to explore uh, this approach because I do believe that it gives us a different way of looking at the world, especially a world where we know there are problems to solve, 
and especially problems that we know are quite intractable, ones that we call complex social problems, problems that you can't solve by just flipping a switch or that you can't solve by just giving, let's say, a vaccine uh, or a certain drug. Those are relatively simple technical issues. Flip on the switch and you've got light and you solve the problem of darkness. But when you deal with issues like malnutrition, when you deal with issues like workplace stress and absenteeism, when you deal with issues like mental health, when you deal with issues like integration of immigrant communities, uh, you cannot just flip a switch and say that problem solved. So intractable complex problems are problems that have a lot of underlying causes and they are intermixed and tangled in ways that you cannot sort them out. So this is an approach especially suited. The more complex the problem, the more relevant, I believe, is the positive deviance approach. Well, oh my god, Lauren! <laughs> <laughs> See, this is an opportunity for me to greet my old friends and meet this little guy here. It's good to see you. Namaste. Yeah. Welcome. Lauren, what class were you? Class eight. Everybody, how old I am? So this is, I mean, you know, at the Clinton School, it's like, you know, what class are you? Because I started, I began with class five. And Lauren, you were class eight? eight. Really? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, sorry for this little chit chat. This is not a complex and tragical uh, problem, but uh, it's lovely. I've seen Lauren after years. Yeah. And of course, this little guy, the first time. Okay, so, so this is an approach to address what are really complex issues. And I've been working with this approach for about 15 years. I've had good mentors, uh, the ones who founded uh, this approach. Uh, I believe I teach what is the only course in the world, a semester-long course on the positive deviance approach. And for Amber to make the mistake of nominating me and inviting me uh, makes me think that uh, maybe uh, this approach may have some potentiality for all of us who are here. I especially want to acknowledge Danielle, friend from Arkansas Children's Hospital, Sterling, and a host of other. You've driven from Jonesboro. My God, we have people who've driven a long ways for this. So, okay, so let's get on with the uh, so Let's see if this will work. Bye. Okay, so we were talking about complex and tractable problems, and I'm just giving you some examples. And you're saying, what, this guy is telling us that there may be a way to address these? Uh, and I'll show you through some examples how we have addressed some of these issues in a rather effective way, with rather startling results, startling in the right direction. Yeah. Okay. So, Blank screen. Okay. <laughs> it's part of the performance. <laughs> Thank you, Amber. You were very good and fixing it. <laughs> See, and these problems you can fix. <laughs> but we want to begin with a blank screen because I have to urge you, encourage you, request you to, if it's possible, it's going to be very difficult, if it's possible to put your mind back to zero. No, this is like erasing the entire hard drive. Scary, but do you think you can try to do it for the next 
30, 40 minutes. Go back to zero, blank screen. Because of the Zen philosophers say, beginner's mind, open mind, full of possibilities. Expert's mind, very few possibilities. So my request to you is see if you can go back to zero. Yeah, possible? You try? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Which means I can get away with anything. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> that's the invitation. Beginner's mind, open mind, see if we can go back to zero. Oh, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody recognize uh, the mistake that I have made? Sterling, you're sort of gently nodding to yourself. And you do? I have shot it. Yeah? And what do you see? Uh, um, I think it's upside down. <laughs> yes. And if it were upside right, then it would be, would it be somebody whom you'd recognize? The guy without the hat. Yeah. Who would that be? I don't know. He yeah. stands out. He stands out? Okay. A gentleman with the big hat. The gentleman with the very big hat. Mr. Yeah. Lincoln. Laura? Mr. Lincoln, did Mr. you say? Lincoln. Oh my God. Upside down, pixels, black and white. Picture taken 150 years ago. And you can still figure this out. Sterling is our man. <laughs> okay. So, Mr. Lincoln, indeed. Uh, Elliot, how tall are you? Six five. Six five. Now, is it six feet and five inches, you think? Yeah. We even know, right? When Elliot says six five, we fill in the gaps. It's not six meters and uh, five centimeters. No. It's six feet and five inches. How much would that be in just plain centimeters? Around 200. Okay. Yeah. And if he if he said, I mean, if he were in a certain part of the world and he said, and if the question was asked, how tall are you? And he says 200. People would perhaps know he's talking about 200 centimeters. If you were in Europe and you said I'm 196, they would know it's one meters and 96 centimeters or 196 centimeters. You get the idea? How tall are you? Six feet. Six feet. Feet. Six. If he had said six, we would know. Right? Now, you see that in the expert's mind, and there's nothing wrong in being an expert, we are very precise about how tall we are. Yeah? Yes? Yeah? Very precise. If somebody asked me how tall I am, if you were to ask me that question, Elliot, I'd say I'm five, eight, and seven eighths. And that seven eighths is very important. <laughs> no, no. Uh, it's like, yeah. And that's the way we look at the world. We look at the world as I'm taller than you, or you know, I'm shorter than you, or you are shorter than me. And this translates into a whole host of other ways of looking at the world, which is you know, I'm driving this car, and you're driving that car. And nothing wrong with it, it's just the way we see our world. Now, Mr. Lincoln, there's a famous story about Mr. Lincoln. He's in a hospital, he's going around, he's shaking hands, he's shaking hands like this, yes. Uh -huh. with soldiers, Union soldiers who, and he basically says, I'm gonna come around, I'm gonna shake your hand, say your name out loud for me, so he's going around, and you know, he comes to a soldier who clicks his heels and salutes him and extends his hand, and then realizes that his hand has to be like this. And he suddenly says, oh, Mr. President, you're tall. How tall are you? And without batting an eyelid, Lincoln says, son, tall enough that my feet
feet reach the ground. Some, like you, tall enough that my feet reach the ground. Now, this kind of a sensibility, where you look at height, but in a flipped manner, is rather rare. And that is because our expertise gets in the way. So Mr. Lincoln knew how tall he was. He was six, four and a half. And if you add his stovepipe hat, the big hat that Sterling talked about, he was over a seven foot. But when asked, and he's being asked as president, he's being asked as commander in chief, Mr. President, how tall are you? Without much thinking, he says, son, like you, tall enough that my feet reach the ground. So in Lincoln's worldview, just through this story, the different ways in which you can look at what is high or low. He says, let's look at it from the perspective of the common ground. And Lincoln is a very interesting person to study when it comes to worldviews because he was very interested in, as some of you may know, uh, geometry. He's very interested in Euclidean geometry. He trained, as you know, as a country lawyer. He never had formal schooling, a year and a half of formal schooling. So his mind wasn't cluttered the way our mind is cluttered. And uh, as a country lawyer, he was very interested in the notion of evidence, what constitutes evidence. And he found Euclidean geometry to be very revealing when it came to evidence or proof. Because the first common law in Euclidean geometry begins by saying that things that are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. And that truth for him was self-evident. And if you go deeper into his life, he will talk about how that in some ways was the basis of his thinking for the Emancipation Proclamation. That things that are equal to the same thing should be equal to each other. Anyway, I mean, that's a digression with Lincoln. So the invitation to you was open mind. And I'm sharing with you a story about the power of the flipped mind. Because we all have this ability to do mental somersaults. But expertise gets in our way because we say that things are the way they are. And that only allows you to see things in a certain way. So let's put Mr. Lincoln back in his place. Sterling looks better now, yeah. So the contention, the invitation is have an open mind. The contention, as I've said, is to solve complex problems, we need flipped, and I'll tell you what I mean by positive mindsets. And solving problems by this flipped mindset, I'm very happy to share the presentation with anybody. You can, you, know, you can write to me and I'll send it and it's there on your computer. Please share it, use the slides if you think there are any good, no need for credit. Uh, you know, this belongs to you. So solving problems by flipping mindsets is how I look at the positive deviance approach. You're with me so far? Mm -hmm. So far, so good. I want to tell you three stories. Sorry, Marsha, no PowerPoints with three points with, you know, bullets in between. I'm just going to share three stories. And if you can internalize these three stories, and we human beings have an innate ability, we are hardwired to retain stories, then you will have the positive view, the basic tenets of the positive deviance approach. Okay, so ready? Ready for story number one? Derek, you ready? Ready to go? All right, okay. Now the first story is a story about a mystical Sufi character by the name of Nasiruddin. And I noticed 
uh, our friend here who's wearing that beautiful burnt orange shirt. Yeah. You were like, yeah, Mr. Nasiruddin. Yeah. You know a little about uh, Mr. Nasiruddin? They mentioned it back in my school. Like when our teachers talked about it. Really? And what did your teachers talk about? Uh, we were having tea. Uh, it was a Turkish class. And, uh, of so course. They started talking about Ali Baba, and then they mentioned Nasiruddin. Okay, good. So he actually existed in uh, central Turkey about uh, 800 years ago. And uh, uh, he was a wise man. That's the reason why he's called Nasiruddin Hoja. Hoja means teacher uh, in Turkish. Uh, some people call him Mullah Nasiruddin because he had, uh, you know, again, he was a teacher or a leader of thought. And uh, there are many stories uh, about him. And of course, now people make up stories about him. He's that kind of a mythical uh, character. And there's one story in particular which may be relevant to our understanding of the positive deviance approach. So the story goes by Nasiruddin. What's the tallest mountain peak in Arkansas? Mount Magazine. 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 Oh, magazine. Like magazine. Okay. See. So uh, Mullah Nasiruddin. Uh, goes to the top of Mount Magazine with a megaphone and he says, uh, I am a smuggler. And catch me if you can. So you can imagine now all the customs border agents, you know, around Mount Magazine are like, okay, <laughs> we got you, Nasiruddin. So uh, the next day, Nasiruddin, after making this announcement, ride in a donkey, loaded with stuff with several other donkeys behind him, loaded with more stuff, comes to the border checkpoint. And the customs official, what do you have, Mr. Nasiruddin? And he says, look. And the customs official looks. He knows how to look. And he looks here and there and everywhere. And Elliot, he finds nothing of interest. So what does he do? What do you do? You've got to let Nasiruddin go. He goes the next day, he's back, he's riding his donkey with stuff, even more stuff loaded. And more donkeys behind with tons of stuff, and the customs of Shush will be like, I'm going to get you today, Nasiruddin, what do you have? And he says, Look, this time, with his expertise, the customs official really, really looks. You know, he looks over and under and on this side and on that side. and under the hoops and behind the ears, and he finds nothing of interest. So what does he do, Joyce? You got to let Nasiruddin go. Off goes Nasiruddin, and the next day he's back again, right on his donkey with even more stuff loaded, and more donkeys with more stuff loaded, and the customs official is like, today you're not going to escape me, Nasiruddin. What is it that you have? And Nasiruddin says, Daniel, what does he say? Look. And this time the customs official, you know, he recalls how he, in his doctoral dissertation, you know, <laughs> had, uh, you know, goes back to his notes and looks over and under and here and there and, you know, behind the ears and under the hoops and puts on his looking glasses and does the sniffing test and, you know, and Finds Elliot of interest. of interest, and so what does he do? What does he do? What can he do? He's got to let him go. This happens day after day. Joyce, after day after day, it happens week after week. Marsha, it happens month after. It happens year after year. It happens. Decade after decade, and you know, by this time he's getting a postdoc, and he's you know, like, <laughs> how do I? Mm -hmm. And the customs official is unable to nail Nasiruddin in an act of wrongdoing. So the customs official goes to the top of Mount Magazine for three or four decades with a megaphone and says, I retire <laughs> from customs checking. And right behind him is Nasruddin, who grabs the microphone and he says, 
And today I announce my retirement <laughs> from <laughs> smuggling. And they happen to meet at the Burrows. Yes. Burrows? 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 Oh, in the borough. They happen to meet in the borough. <laughs> and uh, for those of you who, there's some of you who may not know the Hendricks campus, but my morning breakfast meeting was in the borough. So Nasiruddin and the customs official happen to meet in the borough. And the customs official walks up to Nasiruddin and he says, Nasiruddin. For 35 years, you have been the cause of me having these sleepless nights. And please, Nasiruddin, please, now that I am in no official capacity to do anything to you, please, for the sake of the Lord and the sake of my peace, tell me, what is it that you were smuggling? Donkeys, <laughs> says Nasiruddin. <laughs> How could the customs official miss the donkeys and the donkeys and the donkeys? The answer to the problem that he was trying to solve was right there in front of him every day, not once, not twice, week after week and month after month and year after year and decade after decade. And the customs official was unable to see the answer, the solution to the problem was right there. Now, you may ask the question, why was that the case? <coughs> And you don't need to answer it. You may answer it in your own way. How many of you were yourself? How many of you really knew it was donkeys? With the gasp and with the ah, donkeys. It sounded to me that some of you were surprised that it was donkeys. And I said donkeys so many times now. What is it about us? What is it about us? that makes us think and look at the world only in a certain way? What is it about us that makes us look at height only as 200 or 65 or 6? There's nothing wrong with this. You're saying that's all good. But there may be other ways of looking. And if you can develop and cultivate this ability to look at things in a different way, you will be at a different place. You're with me so far? Sorry, that was story number one. Let's see what I have here. So the premise of the positive deviance approach, and now you'll have to help me, see if you can say this out loud, right? Every time you see a piece of text, if all of you can say it out loud, the premise of the positive deviance approach is? Solutions to complex problems exist. You're so good, all of you. Derek, you were a little interior. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> This is the way it is. And nothing wrong with a little bit of arrogance if you, even temporarily, that's the key, temporarily can suspend your arrogance, which is the invitation that I gave you. Suspend what you know temporarily. See if you can flip your mind. See if you can see what's not there 
or what actually is there, but you are incapable of seeing. So far, so good. You're with me. Okay. Ah, story number two. Anybody? You recognize Mr. Nasiruddin, but. <laughs> How about the other people? Sisters of Charity. Sisters of Charity, see? Well, nothing wrong with identifying Mother Teresa, but you see how we own it? Mm -hmm. What about, you know, all the others who are there? Sisters, missionaries of charity. And there are many stories about Mother Teresa. I don't know if I have that. Oh, yeah, okay. This was the first letter that Mother Teresa wrote to me. The year was 1979, and we had a correspondence relationship that lasted about 12 years. And so I became I became a collector of Mother Teresa's stories. My pants crossed with her many times. And uh, oh, sorry, no. mm -hmm. press the wrong button. <laughs> Technical glitch. <laughs> so sorry. Yeah, technical things go wrong sometimes. Nothing we can't solve, right? Oh uh, yeah. These problems we can solve. Yeah. So there's a story about Mother Teresa which is relevant here. This is your second story to understand positive deep. In 1974, Mother Teresa arrived in Washington, D.C. on a private visit. And she landed at Dallas. And she, you know, arrival hall comes in, and she was expecting to see, as Tom has said, two sisters from the Missionaries of Charity, you know. And she did see them, but between her and these two sisters were about a thousand people. And they had placards, you know, like, oh, Mother, we are so happy you're here. And uh, a representative walked up to Mother Teresa and said, Mother, we are so happy you're here. Tomorrow we're having a march in Washington, and we'd like for you to march with us. And mother says, well, my child, what's the march about? She says, mother, we are marching in Washington against the Vietnam War. And mother says, ah, you're marching in Washington against the Vietnam War. And so he says, so what say you, mother? You're going to march with us, right? And mother says, I am so sorry, my child. Yeah, that's what he says. That's what she says. I am so sorry, my child. She always said, my child. And, you know, somebody at the back, like, what? What did she say? She's not going to march with us? And the representative's like, mother, so you, you, what? Did you say you're not going to march with us? No, we want you to march with us. And she said, my child, if you're going to have a march in Washington against the Vietnam War, I am. So sorry, my child. But if you were to choose to have a march in Washington for peace, I will be the first to. Roger, Babu. I will be the first to lead. Hmm. So, Joyce. For Mother Teresa, being against the Vietnam War and being for peace. Same thing? No? Not the same thing? Different? Elliot, you disagree with her? You agree? Oh, I do agree. You do agree? They're different for Mother Teresa? For one, I'm so sorry, my child. I know there are thousands of you, and you want me to march, and you've got placards, and I'm so sorry. But on the other hand, if you choose, if you choose to march for peace, I will be the first to lead. I will be the first to lead. This is a different way of thinking. When we try to solve complex problems, we almost always begin by asking, what's the problem? Right? How many of us do research and you begin with a problem statement? 
nothing wrong with it. But you always begin by asking what's the problem, which means you're always asking what am I up against? Nothing wrong with it, it's a way of thinking. You're asking what am I up against? You're asking what is not working? You're asking what are the gaps? You're asking what are the deficits? And then with your expertise, once you can ascertain what the problems are, what the gaps are, what the deficits are with your expertise, you try to plug the gaps. And I do a lot of work with uh, global health issues, and the world of global health is replete with terminology that is, who's at the highest risk? Nothing wrong with it. But if you ask the question, who's at the highest risk, and what characteristics they have, then you're not asking the other four perspective that Mother Teresa is encouraging us to look at. So she's basically saying, if you choose to begin by asking what are the problems, what are the gaps, what are the deficits, what do people don't know, what do people don't think, what is it that they don't do, then you'll go down a certain path. But perhaps you should ask, what are you for? Because that will take you to a somewhat different place. So we are against sex trafficking. We are against substance abuse. We are against teenage pregnancy. We are against nothing wrong with it. But if you are against something, then you will go down a certain path to fix what you think is deficient in the system. But Mother Teresa is saying, as opposed to asking what are you against, ask what are you for. Instead of asking what are the deficits, ask what are the assets. Instead of asking what's not working, ask what's working. Because it will take you to a different place. You with me so far? We don't even ask, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, I want to solve a problem. What's the problem? Oh, this is a problem. Okay. If that's the problem, this is not working. It's not working because it's missing this and this and this. Okay, so now we'll fix it. That's fine. It's one way of looking. What we are saying is by flipping your mindset and asking what's working, what are the assets, what's working against all odds. You may be at a different place. You with me? Moving on, story three. You know who do you see? I know the middle guy. How <laughs> about the other two guys? See? Uh, no, it's not Nehru, but he's sort of, he's wearing the Nehru cap. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good pride. <laughs> Okay, Gandhi. Does anybody know his first name? I'm not asking Lauren. Yeah. Mahandas. Now make up your mind. <laughs> so, you say Mahatma. Mahandas. Mahandas. Both. Both. Why not? I don't you know. Why go with either or? You can go with. Oh, Mahatma was his title. It was a title that was given to him. And does anybody know what Mahatma means? <coughs> Mahan Atma. Mahan, great. Atma, soul. So, I mean, you know, Mahatma Gandhi is great soul, Gandhi. And they began to call him a Mahatma. First time that term was used for him was in 1912. He was 43. He hadn't even come back to it yet. This is when he was doing work in South Africa. His, uh, his first name was Mohan Das. His second name was Karamchanda, and he had a long name. Mohan Das Karamchanda, M.K. Gandhi. We know him as Mahatma. Now, he trained as a, I don't know, some of you know what profession, what training he had? He's a lawyer. Where did he study from? 
in England, London. Yes, yeah. he was called to the bar in London. He was 22 when he was, became a lawyer. Um, and now, as a lawyer, you'd expect him to be dressed better, right? <laughs> what kind of, what's he, is he wearing anything? No. What kind of a lawyer? No. Is he? So, to us, he was, we called him Rashtrapita, which Lauren means the father of the Indian nation. Rashtra is nation, Pita is father. Father of the Indian nation. That was his official, you know, again, a title. Uh, but lovingly, we call him Bapu. Everybody called him Bapu, which is father. Right? And, and there's so many stories about uh, him being the father of the Indian nation because whenever his wife, Kasturba, was asked, uh, Mrs. Gandhi, how many kids do you have? And she said, I have four. And then she'd look at her husband and say, he has 400 million. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, so father of the Indian nation never commanded, uh, he never held any political office. This may come as a surprise to you. Never a president, never a prime minister. Nehru was prime minister, first prime minister. And he was no Caesar. Yep. He was no Napoleon, you know, didn't command any of these vast uh, military campaigns that we, you know, no artistic talent. I mean, his writing was like a spider, you know, walking mom, mom, mom. over ink. Mom, mom, mom. Uh, no scientific achievement. No, you know, no Einstein, no Fermi. Uh, he wasn't particularly going to win any beauty contest, as you can tell. <laughs> yeah. He was five feet, uh, four and a half inches, exactly a feet lower than Mr. Lincoln. You can imagine how Gandhi's like this. Yeah. Skin was chocolate brown weighed 110 pounds, but yet, but yet, we know him. And when he was often asked, you know, like, what's your purpose in life? He'd say, the purpose of my life is to reduce myself to zero. Now, when I flew to, I have to confess, I bought an economy class ticket, as I should, for, you know, flying here. But because I do a little bit of traveling, sometimes, uh, you know, you uh, may be already inside the plane, and it's a full flight, and then somebody walks up to you, and they say, they clear your throat, and, you know, they clear their throat, and say, are you Dr. Singhal? And you say, yes. And they say, well, sir, would you like to move up? To, and what does it do to you? Just put yourself in my position. And especially if you're traveling with colleagues. Uh, that's like, oh, that's so good. No. When, are you talking? Yes, that's me. Of course, you, you know, sort of mellow that part, of, that glee part you have to have. You know, it's a little more nonchalant. Yes, uh, that's me. Uh, would you, uh, we've got a seat for you in uh, first class, and you say, me, more. Say so yes, you. And you know, you suddenly, because you are going to move to business class, you know, you have a, your movements are a little more accentuated. <laughs> and you've got to play the role, right? You get up, and you know, there you, you, you've got a slow step, you pull your bag, you sort of wave to your friends, and you know, with a very gentle stride, you. And you know it. You know, that's the way it is. Now you're, you you got to be in business, right? So you'd better act business-like. And then, of course, you know, they ask you, what is it you'd like to drink, right? And, you know, you may take a vodka martini, you know, shake it, not stir I've actually even said that once or twice, just you know, to invoke uh, Sean Connery and James Bond, just to see, you know, how it... Uh, and then, of course, you got to take a picture of that vodka martini, right? <laughs> and then do what? Post it straight on Facebook, <laughs> right? Because, I mean, you know, if you've traveled first class and 
nobody knows you've traveled first class, then have you really traveled first class? <laughs> and I learned that principle of journalism, you know, that tree falls in the forest and there's nobody who sees it or reports it, then has the tree really fallen? You no, know? so that's the way we work, right? Experts, we work in a certain way. Problem solvers, we work in a certain way. Look at problem. And we are always trying to get to the next class. And here's Mr. Dandi, who is telling us that the purpose of my life is to reduce myself to zero. It's a little different, yeah? That's the reason why he's the Mahatma. That's the reason why he could take 400 million Indians and without doing anything to them, have 200,000 British who had occupied India 200 years simply walk away. Why? Because when 400 million Indians refused to cooperate with, as Gandhi called it, the British system of evil, peaceful, non-violent, non-cooperation, what are they going to do? Just have to walk away. Yeah? So he spun his own cloth. No, Frank. Yeah? No. Yes. No. That's Mr. Gandhi. No. Yes, that's him. How many of us know about the salt march? Salt? What about Sala? He took on the British government. And then they like well, marched in line for the British soldiers and the soldiers beat them. Salt. Now you know, uh, what was the Boston Tea Party about? Tax. Yeah. Tax. The British tax tea. Here. And do you know where that tea came from? <laughs> India. No, I mean, this is the vast empire, right? Tea from India, you know, comes to Boston Harbor, and of course it's taxed. So they make money there, they make money here, and what's the Boston Tea Party? The protest. The British taxed a whole host of things. Tea was one of them. In India, they tax salt, among, you know, 500 other things, which means the British government had a complete monopoly on the production and sale of salt. And because Gandhi lived like a poor man, because he had reduced his life to zero, he realized as a lawyer, and as a citizen, that the only thing that the poor people needed more than the rich was salt. Why? Because if you are working under the Indian sun, what do you do? Perspire. You lose salt. So the petition that he wrote to his brother, the Viceroy, Lord Irwin, was actually a legal appeal. He said, my brother, I ask you to repeal the tax that the British government levies on salt. And my argument is that by taxing salt, you put a differential burden on the poorest of the poor. Because all of us need salt, and the poor need more. So by taxing salt, you're taxing the poor people more than the rich. And he was saying, please, I ask you that you repeal it. Because this, the appeal to the British sense of moral justice. And what did Lord Boisterer, Irvin, say? He said, salt. He wants to take on the British government on salt. Let him. And Gandhi announced that he was going to walk to the sea 240 miles and make his own salt. Because salt exists in and when, in 1931, 8 million Indians on a certain day, because India has a long coastline, went to the sea to make their own salt, as they were boiling seawater in their kettles, the foundations of the British government had begun to shake. Because everybody needs salt. And he could only get to it because he could think about being with the poorest of the poor and living the life that they did. Otherwise, why would he think of salt to take on the British government? So here he's traveling uh, by a train. And what 
class of service do you see on the top left? Yes. Third. You know, at that time you could travel first class, second class, or third class. Mm -hmm. I was very happy when I came to first class. Mm -hmm. so they, when the presidential plane takes off, what's the name of the presidential plane? Mm -hmm. Air, Force Air Force One. Air Force One. What's the official title of the wife of the president? First Lady, and we hope someday it'll be first gentleman. First, first, first. And Gandhi traveled by third class like a commoner, even when he was Rashtrapita, when he was father of the Indian nation. And this drove the Indian people crazy. It's like, Babu, we can do better as a country. Why do you have to travel third class? And his response was always the same. I travel third class because, as you know, there is no fourth class. This is the third flight. Look at it from the perspective of the fourth class. So if you put all these stories together, Lincoln, flip mindset. Mother Teresa, what are you for? Nasiruddin, what is it that I'm not seeing? And Gandhi, to look at things from the perspective of the fourth class, you've got positive deviance. If you can apply these different ways of thinking holistically, you've got positive deviance. How are we doing on time? Depending on how much time we have, I will see how much further to go. Five minutes, 10, over, five? Okay. So let me illustrate with an example. True story. The year is 1990. 65% of the kids in the country of Vietnam were malnourished. Okay. A person by the name of Jerry Sturgeon, who was my positive deviance guru, he passed away in 2008. Four years. His wife, Monique, is still around. Jerry and Monique arrive in Vietnam. And through a strange set of circumstances, they ask a very different question. A question which had never ever before in the world of malnutrition been asked. The question they asked were, are there well-nourished children? No. Now, is this Mother Teresa? What's working? OK. Among the poorest of the poor, that's Mr. Gandhi, the fourth class. Yeah. And so the first, are there well-nourished children? Oh yeah, we've got some. Oh, among the well-nourished children, are there some who come from the poorest of the poor? Yeah. A few. Poor children who are well-nourished. But there aren't very many of them. But if there are poorest of the poor children who are well-nourished, the answer to solving the problem is right there. That's the Nasiruddin's donkeys. You know where to look. The answer is there. Because somebody among the poorest of the poor has solved the problem. And they've done it within their own culture and their own context. So they, you know, collect data, 3,000 kids in four communities, and, you know, they plot the data, and they see there are lots of red dots. Yeah, they plot the data. Red dots are malnourished kids, and green dots are well-nourished kids, and of course, you know, 65% of them are red. With positive deviance, you begin with the red dots or the green? The green, what's working? Okay, we usually always work with the red. No, we say like the greens, they fix the problem. You keep whipping the red dots. Okay, you'll whip the red dots, because you want to turn them into green, but not now. You begin with the green dots. Now, are you interested, this is the quintessential positive deviance question, in all the green dots? Yes? Yes? No! You are only interested in the green dots that should be red. Are you 
interested in all the green dots? Yeah. Why not? Because most of the green dots you'd expect to be green. You know, they come from well-to-do families, blah, 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 blah. You are only interested in the green dots that actually should be red. But they're green. Right? Are there well-nourished children? Green dots. Among the poorest of the poor, well, most of the ones who are green are not the poorest of the poor. So you keep eliminating all the green dots until you find a dot which is unexplainable. And now you've got your donkeys. Because these people have solved the problem. The answer is here. So in Vietnam, you know, they found 24 kids out of 3,000 who should have been red, but who were green. The answer is here. They went digging. You know, like, what's happening here? Something must be happening here. And they realized that in this particular household, mothers were adding the shoots, the greens of sweet potato plants to the broth. What do we do with the greens of sweet potato plants? How many of us have seen them? One positive vegan. <laughs> Most of us don't even know what you use them as fodder because they are shoots. You're interested in the sweet potato. Everything else you don't see. These mothers were adding the greens. Oh, now you ask, what do the greens have? Now you can ask the science question. Oh, they have beta carotene. You know, they have minerals. They have micronutrients. Oh my God, the wisdom to solve the problem exists here. The resources to solve the problem exist here. So you ask the mother, Pam, how long have you been doing so? I've been doing this for 30 years. That's how my mother raised me, and now I'm raising my kids that way. Sweet <laughs> The donkeys have been coming and going for 30 years. never really had the eyes to see that. Because we were looking as experts somewhere here. The wisdom is here. And you, are, you found the wisdom by asking what's working and what's working among the fourth class. And if it's working among the fourth class, by definition, it should work for everybody. The answer is here. So that's the positive deviance way of solving problem. And I will take the jiggle example because some of my, so they used the positive deviance approach. This is a very well documented case. There were 16 studies coordinated by the Emory University School of Nutrition. And uh, these were the results. So this is the positive deviance premise. We've used positive deviance to address issues of teenage pregnancy. I can tell you more about it in Q&A if we have time. But let's talk about this. Denmark, a country which has one of the lowest rates of recidivism. Recidivism, what is recidivism? Repeat, Repeat, returning back. What are the rates of recidivism here in the US? Anybody? Let's say for three years, like returning back. 65%. So if you commit a crime, of you know, the 100 people who commit a crime, the chances that they'd be back within three years, 65%. Do you know what the rate is in Denmark? It's about 15%. But it comes at a human cost. What's the human cost? The human cost is if you are a jailer, a prison guard in a Danish prison, you miss almost 35 days of work absenteeism. The average retirement, voluntary retirement age for a Danish prison worker is 48. Most other government workers work until they are 60. Hmm. What does this tell you? The number of mental health prescriptions that a Danish prison official has is five times that of other government officials. What does this tell you? Absenteeism, not showing up for work, 
retiring at 48, mental health issues. They are? Yes. This is a very high pressure job. And where is it the highest pressure? In maximum security prisons, right? They're sort of the fourth class of the prison system. So we asked a very simple question, I and mean, they've been trying to solve this problem of you know, taking care of their workers for a very long time. And so the question that was posed was, are there guards in maximum security prisons who are in excellent mental health? What does that mean? No mental health prescriptions, or maybe one in the last 10 years. Rarely absent. Now these are data that is all collected, that is available. It's very data driven. And who have, and this was a cause of very high stress, very few acts of violence committed against that. Because that's the stress. You're in a maximum security prison, you know, I mean, you're very scared of the ones who are there in maximum security. You get the idea? This is a flipped question. You've got Mother Teresa here. What's working? Are there guards who are in good mental health? In maximum security prisons, that's the fourth class, right? Against all odds, yeah? And measurable data. And when you ask a question like this, which is rarely asked, much like the question about malnourished children among the poorest of the poor, you say, well, yeah, well, yeah, we do have a few guards. Oh my God, they're not absent. Oh my God, they are not visiting mental health cells. Oh my God, there aren't too many violent acts committed against them. I'm interested in figuring out, figuring out what is it that they do, right? What are the donkeys? They've solved the problem, right? You don't need other experts to come in and solve the problem. They've solved the problem already. Do you know what they found? What we found? You want to know? Yes. No. You do? They found that some of these guards had just decided, made a pact with themselves. And what was the pact? The pact was, okay, let's rewind a little. If you are a prison official in a maximum security prison and a prisoner checks in, what's the first thing you look at? When you open your, your dossier. What did it? What they did? Right? There were some people, some of these guards who were in good health, who had just made a pact with themselves. I'm not going to read the dossier. What does that do? Forces you to treat them all the same. No judgment. Okay, but what does it do to you if you are not, I mean, it's a question of what is not being done to you. So when you don't judge, when you treat them the same, how do they respond? They respond in a human way. As compared to those who like, you know, do guards have that attitude? Well, the scum of the earth. Huh? that shows no judgment. In fact, prisoners were telling us, we save our lives by killing our curiosity. Lord, the answers are there. I'm not saying that you should recommend this. Well, you find another prison guard, like, figure out what is it that they're doing. This prison guard, usual procedure, prisoners come in, they check in, you have them sit, across, you're on your computer, you know, like, mm, they're filling in the details. This prison guard, no, no, none of that. Prisoner checks in, he walks out, shakes his hand, and says, uh, well, we can take care of these processes later. Uh, let me give you a tour of the prison. A tour of the prison? Yes. And he takes you around and says, you know, this is where you play soccer, and, you know, this is your yeah. swimming pool, and it's Danish prison. And, you know, and, and here's your bubbler, your jacuzzi, allowed 15 minutes, and you know, that's your cafeteria, and you know, we serve uh, mama's apple pie on Friday evening, and then they come back and they, what does that do? 
What does that do? What does, how does that explain low levels of stress? Or fewer violent acts committed against them? What do you think? He deals rapport with the prisoners. Rapport. In fact, prisoners who've been treated that way tell other prisoners, don't you dare touch. Mm -hmm. So good. Treat them simply like a human being. And we found a few other things, and I'll wind up with this. One of the prisoners talked about this guard who would jingle their keys. Do you think guards get a lot of keys? Yes. Keys after keys after keys. Because in a maximum security prison, doors close behind doors behind. And then what happens when you hear the last click? Right? You're like in your cell. So in Danish prisons, they worry about plumbing. They've seen Prison Break, and is that, what's, is that the name of the show? Prison Break? Prison. Yeah. It had something to do with plumbing, no? I hear. Okay. So, in Dutch, in, sorry, in Danish prisons, uh, plumbing is all outside of cells, which means if you need to go, you ring a buzzer, and you know, the guard appears, and they take you out, you do your stuff, and you are left back in. Normative practice is when the prisoner presses the buzzer. The guards, well, what are they doing? They're so bored, right? They're sitting in their, you know, little whatever, you know, watching TV or playing poker or, you know. And if the buzzer rings, do you think they are in any hurry to get out? They're in no hurry. Yeah, like, that's normative practice, now. Let them squirm. It's OK. Come on. Okay, they can wait. Well, there's some guards who don't. They respond. And prisoners talked about how they jingle their keys and what that meant to them. And he said, and guess what? The jingling stopped when they would be outside their cells. What's normative practice? If you've been summoned, the guards open the door because they've been invited, but these guards, they pause. And then they sort of knock. And they say, are you ready? May I come in? One guard in the prison, they ask for permission. Mm -hmm. And they enter. And they say, OK. And they go. And then the prisoners talked about what happened when they returned after using the facilities. They said, what's normative practice? What do most guards do once you've done your job? You slam the door behind them, right? Like, right? Not them, not these few prison guards. Because slamming the door, the last click, and what it does to them. So they said, here are some guards who say, OK, you know. We are done now, and they just verbalize, I'm going to close the door now. Bye, have a good night. That last click. What does that do? You figure it out, right? Small little things, accessible to everybody, which, so what do you do? Well, we. Well, you take these ideas, you incidents of violent acts in the next six months by taking the wisdom that existed by 40%. So let me know. No matter what the problem, and the more complex the problem, there are positive demons. They're hidden from plain view. There was once in a talk by Steven Spielberg, 1986, USC. <laughs> and 1986, so as in response to a question, Spielberg said this the camera denies the existence of what it 
does not see. And if you flip it, basically he's saying that what the camera sees is animated, can be animated, can be accentuated, can be, and this is a very useful reminder for us. What we choose to see, what we choose not to see. Yeah. How do we see? Do we see it as being against or do we look at the aspiration of what works for those for whom it should work? Something that we know as best practices. In PD, in positive deviance, you look at the worst case scenario. What's working with those who really should not in any way come close to solving the problem? So useful reminder for all of us. So I think I'm in here. When you see the world in a certain way, as this, or as this, or as this, or as this, ask yourself if you can see it in a different light. And if you do, you will end up at a different place. And that's the hope of this positive deviance approach. So thank you very much. taken all the time for you and Anne. Yes, but we will take a couple of questions if there are folks who want to stay around to ask questions. I actually might suggest a somewhat different process. That's fine. Would Whatever it be okay if we completely flip the way we do Q&A? Normative practice, you have, you know, a few minutes for Q&A and what happens? Somebody raises their hand and then there are others who are saying, oh God, he goes again. <laughs> 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 And they hold the floor, and what's wrong with that? And that's fine. Uh, I think it would be disrespectful uh, of just, us to just take uh, just, one question or comment uh, publicly. Just, uh, so I'm going to flip this. Flip it. I'm going to ask you to rise. Rise. Nothing. Stand up. Rise. I'm going to have you turn to the person who is the closest to you, whether it's on your left or right, or mm -hmm, and take. 30 seconds each. If you have a question, if you have a comment, if you have a moment of aha, if you are like, oh, this is you know, crap, whatever <laughs> comes to your mind, whatever you wish to say, go ahead and share it. 30 seconds each. Go, now, in a minute, <laughs> <laughs> we'll be But we do want to harvest whatever you may have heard. So I'm not interested in what you said. I'm only interested in what you heard. Because if you heard something which stuck to you, then it's important that we share it. So can we invite a few people to take a sentence or two, whether you heard a question or a comment, and bring it to all of us? Danielle, what did you hear? Talk a lot, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sterling, what did you hear? Find a solution that works. Let that drive you. All right. Sterling talked about feeling it's nice to kind of feel recharged. Uh, 
I don't see you here. Mm, what else? Mm. Elliot, what did you hear? There is shrimp in the rice fields. That's, <laughs> that too, I didn't tell you the shrimp story. <laughs> so we got a vegetarian mm -hmm. version. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so the, shrimps, so the sweet potato shoots, they were living tiny, teeny shrimps. Yes. <laughs> what did you hear, sir? I heard that question. And the question was? About her research topic. Oh, beautiful. Okay. And uh, what did you hear, Joyce? Um, that you can, if you write in a thesis, for example, you can ask your key questions at the stage of um, creating your surveys or interview questions. So I've directed 12 master's thesis <laughs> at the University of Texas. We don't have a doctoral program, and that's the reason why I'm there. And all 12 have been on positive media. We've looked at teenage pregnancy, diabetic management, we've looked at uh, breastfeeding in the workplace, we've looked at student success, and all kinds of complex issues. What else did you hear very quickly, which you really have to share with everybody? Um, Deanne, Deanne? Deanne. 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 Deanne shared um, about how to use PD in education settings. And that's one thing we didn't get into, is not just the words, but the physical space. Yes. Changing the physical spaces. Yeah, you can, and I, I, I tend to it happens. The classes that I peeked in, you know, it's traditionally not rows and columns here. And that makes a difference. That little thing makes a big difference. Anything else? Last closing comment. Question or comment that you heard. Marsha. Solution for like individualized PD, not looking at a collective outlier, but just one individual and how that will work. Yes, in social services. By definition, deviants can be n equals one. N equals one. If one person has solved the problem, and if that solution is accessible to all. But you can also ask the positive deviance question at many levels. And maybe that's something to add. You can ask. Are there certain schools in a certain county that, with no extra resources, are doing better? Are there certain prisons in a certain state which, with access to no resources, where you are doing better? Better in terms of whatever you're trying to. Are there certain police officials who are, you know, engaging with uh, the issue of trafficking or with drug abuse in ways that most others aren't? Because deviance, by definition, exists everywhere. Because we make our living as social scientists looking at variance, right? Analysis of variance, what's different, what? So if there's variance, there's deviance. And you're looking for deviance, not in Durkheim's or in other sociological sense of, yeah, but you're looking at statistical deviance of the good kind, positive outliers. So thank you for rising and thank you for indulging me in this flipped way of Q&A. Thank you.